Well, Psalm 22, of course, is an incredible psalm. Uh, it is obviously written by David, and David expresses some of his, his, some of his own uh, anguish and concern. Uh, but amazingly, a psalm that was written a thousand years before Christ uh, points directly uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, one commentator has recorded these words. He says that Psalm 22 records the most anguished cry in human history. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What an incredible cry. You can see that in Matthew 27 and 46. It's, it's Jesus quoting Psalm 22. Uh, David uh, has written this psalm a thousand years earlier, perhaps unaware of how accurate it would be to the Lord Jesus' experience. Because this psalm is not only about David's trials and David's betrayal, but it's quite clearly pointing us uh, to the greater David, King Jesus himself. So it's a cry of loneliness when I'm feeling lonely and forsaken. And quite simply today we want to look at this psalm uh, under these two headings, the depths of forsakenness. And, and please take the time to read Psalm 22 and then Matthew 27 and you'll see how accurate and how clearly uh, this speaks to us of the Lord Jesus Christ, the man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed. So we look firstly at the depths of forsakenness and secondly at the heights of God's triumph and victory. Uh, there's been many uh, movies or TV series about Jesus and his death and his crucifixion. Some might recall Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ. Uh, what is interesting in those movies or those series is the focus is on the physical sufferings of Jesus, which of course were great and, uh, and real. Uh, the Roman torture was, was cruel. Uh, the nails in his hands and his feet. And of, and of course, that is true. But the gospel writers want to point us to the ultimate horror, the, the, the ultimate pain. It wasn't the nails uh, that fastened his hands and his feet, but it was this cry of utter desolation. The pain of being forsaken. The hymn writer puts it like this, Give me a sight, O Saviour, of your wondrous love to me, of the love that brought me down to earth to die on Calvary. Was it the nails, O Saviour, that bound you to the tree? No, was your everlasting love, your love for me, for me. Oh, make me understand. Help me to take it in. What it meant to you, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. Here is Jesus then quoted these words from Psalm 22 that David had penned. And we see and learn from this. And we learn from other passages in the New Testament, for example, in Jesus' temptations, we learn that Jesus was saturated in the Old Testament. In fact, he makes many quotes from the book of Deuteronomy and, and quotes as we've seen from the Psalms. These were, in, in the words of one uh, uh, Puritan writer, these were the precious remedies against Satan's devices. In other words, these are the precious truths that counteract 
that are the antidote to uh, the strategy and the wickedness of the devil. So Jesus, in his agony, saturates his mind and heart in the Word of God. And the recurring remedy for all of us is to keep filling our minds with the words of Scripture. Keep speaking that Scripture back to our minds and our hearts. In other words, as we've been saying, preach the truth to yourself. Now notice that this anguish uh, cry, which is, strangely enough, it's a prayer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? And he goes on to speak of the words of his groaning. Uh, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. What's he doing? He's still praying to his father. And his prayer is, my God, my God. And so this, this reminds us of the great anguish in which the Lord Jesus himself was in. When he says, my God, my God, it's not a cry of unbelief. It's a cry of prayer. It's not an ungodly cry. It's a cry to his Father in heaven. He's abandoned by the Father to condemnation and judgment. He's handed over to the very wrath of God because of your sin and mine. Here's what our sin cost. It cost Jesus to be abandoned by his Father. It cost the full fury of the wrath of God against sin. And here is Jesus stretched out on the cross. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? It's a sobering thought. And it should help to guard us against a casual view of our sin. Your sin and my sin is no small thing. Your sin and my sin nailed him to the tree. It's a story of being forsaken. Of being alone. Of being abandoned. It's something that is deeply painful. And we hear about people being abandoned in relationships or children being abandoned and forsaken or uh, different uh, situations where people are devastated. They're, they're all alone. They're broken. How much worse can it feel when God has abandoned his one and only son. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And notice, this abandonment, this forsakenness was intentional. Jesus was intentionally abandoned and forsaken by his father. Notice what the psalm goes on to say, Yet you are holy and throned on the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But here is Jesus. He's abandoned intentionally. To be forsaken, to be abandoned means uh, to, to abandon a person, to, to depart from them, uh, to be far from them. It, it, it describes the, the, the story of Israel in their, in their waywardness when they forsook God, they abandoned God. It can refer to spiritual adultery in the book of Hosea. And you see verse 2 says, Why are you so far from saving me? 
David the psalmist knows that God is a rescuing God. That's what he knows. His psalms are full of it. And you and I know that God is a rescuing God. He's the all-sufficient God. And how has he rescued us? By forsaking and abandoning his own son, whom he loved so deeply, in order to turn away his wrath from us, in order to satisfy his holy justice for sin in us, he abandoned his holy son. He's a rescuing God. Now some of you have been there. You felt abandoned and forsaken. There's been emotional distress. There's been all kinds of hurt and concern. But here is God. He seems distant and silent. And we find that very painful and confusing, don't we? When there's silence, like David does here, and like Jesus did on the cross, the Son of God who enjoyed unhindered access in, into the very presence of his Father is now forsaken and enduring the pain and suffering of our sin. And you see verse 3 and 3 to 5 there tells us who God is and, and what God has done. You are holy. You're enthroned in the praises of Israel. This is who God is. It's hard to imagine but that's the fact. And yet here is the holy God forsaken his holy son. Martin Luther, one of the reformers, in had the famous quote when it comes to this passage in Matthew he says it's God forsaken God how, how do you get your head around that the God who says I'll never leave you nor forsake you but in order to bring justice and uh, reconciliation between sinful man and the holy God God forsaken God. You know, when you feel like heaven is silent, as though life is a painful reminder to us again and again, and you feel abandoned. But you know, ultimately, yes, we can feel that, but ultimately, for the child of God, you and I are never truly forsaken. All this reminds us of a very significant and important truth that we learn from this. This is the sinless Son of God. This reminds us, and, and you can see this in the life of the prophets, in the life of the apostles, in the lives of God's people, right through the Bible and down to the present day that pain and suffering and brokenness can coexist with faith and hope in God. Yes, the psalmist is in trouble. Yes, Jesus is in anguish. But he's feeding his mind on the great and precious promises of the Word of God. He's anchoring his mind and his soul to the God who is sovereign, to the God who, who, who is his Father. And he has an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. He's fueling his mind. Yes, he's uttering a prayer, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look at what he endures in the personal attacks 
there in verse 6. I am a worm, not a man. Scorned and despised by people. All who see me mock me. They, 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 they make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts the Lord. Let him deliver. What does that tell you of? Read Matthew 27. It's the loneliness of Jesus on the cross. There's mockery. There's, there's the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. There's, there's the words of the gospel writer in Matthew 27. He's beaten, mocked, and scorned. Verse 9, yet, yet, you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. He sees the goodness and the kindness of God. He recalls that. You know many of the hymns uh, do that, don't they? William Cowper was a man who suffered greatly with mental health. He was a, a quite a top lawyer at a time but succumbed to I suppose in those days they called it melancholy, great anguish of mind and heart but you know from, from that sense of, of Cowper's experience we have deep deep truths that he put into poetry that he put into to hymns God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform here's what he says Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. You see, for William Cowper, with all his difficulties of mental health, his anguish of soul, God was personal to him. And behind the dark clouds which we so much dread, he says, shall break with mercy on your head. You go down to verse 12 to 18, you see the expression of being overwhelmed, don't you? Uh, many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan. People, in other words, who are opening their mouths and they're, they're, they're giving a difficult time. They're like a ravening and roaring lion, verse 13. I'm being poured out like water, he says, verse 14. And all my bones are out of joint. What's that tell you of? It tells you of Jesus on the cross, doesn't it? My heart melted. My strength dried up. Verse 17, I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide their garments among them. They divide my garments among them for my clothing and cast lots. Exactly what happened at the cross. Here he is. He's been, he's been poured out like water. All his bones are out of joint. His strength is dried up. His tongue is sticking to the roof of his mouth. God has brought him to the very dust of death. It's an extraordinary, amazing, something that is hard to fathom of the lingering, suffering death of the Lord Jesus. But notice verse 19, but, but you, O Lord, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly. To my aid, deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. Well, he keeps trusting, doesn't he? He's asking God for help. He's looking in faith. You know, it's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Is to keep on praying and keep on crying to God and to keep on seeking and to keep on knocking it's hard 
when there's silence. But it takes belief. It takes trust. It takes trust to ask again and again and again. So the worst thing that we can do is to stop knocking, is to stop seeking, and to stop asking. It takes belief to ask again and again when you feel abandoned. You see, the psalmist confesses his need here in verses 19 to 21. But there's a turning point. There's a, there's a bright and shining life. It's an amazing thing. He's plumbed the depths of forsakenness. And now you see the heights of triumph and victory. Look at the language. In, in, in verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. I will praise you. Verse 23. You who fear the Lord. Praise him. All your offspring of Jacob. Glorify him. And stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him. But has heard when he cried to them. Verse 25. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who who fear him. What a change from despair to praise. He's calling them to praise God. It's a picture of that great day of triumph when time sh shall be no more. When the, 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 the justice of God has been satisfied and there's triumph and victory over death and hell. Well, Jesus' response then is, is, is one of praise. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, we would have sang earlier. To his feet, my tribute way. Why? Ransom, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like we should sing his praise? The great reason for our rejoicing the great reason for our rejoicing and our worship of King Jesus is that he has risen and that he lives forevermore. It is that the Father has delivered him from the grave. The tomb is empty. And we are now called to worship him who sits on his throne in the heavens. The throne is occupied by King Jesus. Let us not fall into slackness when God commands us to gather together to praise his name, the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, becomes the triumphant victor. Let us not forget these truths and let us not fail to sing with loudest praise to him who loved us and gave himself for us. Now you'll notice the kind of people that are gathered here to worship him. To pour out their, 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 their hearts to him. They are the afflicted. Verse 26. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. Verse 27 to 29. Look at this. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him. Bow down to him. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord unto the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness 
to a people, to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Here is Jesus with risen power. He's praising his God and Father. This is the triumphant view that the gospel brings. It's a triumphant view of the church ultimately. For we read there, don't we? All the ends of the earth, verse 27, shall remember and turn to the Lord. Verses 29 to 31, you have all classes of men and women and cultures. Do you remember where we began? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry of human anguish. And here we are now at a cry of triumph and praise. You see, in Jesus, the psalm tells us that all that needs to be done for man's salvation has been done. You see how it finishes? He has done it. Done what? Doesn't that sound very much like the Gospels? It is finished. It's a triumphant shout of victory. That Jesus has done all that is necessary for man's salvation. All that is necessary. Man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We sing that song as well. My debt is paid, it is paid in full by the Saviour's blood. Well, how can you know this salvation? Well, it's through the living and active Word of God. You see, the church's role in this in this world is to be a great worldwide mission. You see that in verse 27? This is like the end of Matthew 20. This is like the Great Commission. Praise God! There's a way open back to God because of Jesus. What is it that Christians must explain and must communicate about the Gospel if people are ever to be saved? It is to tell them the truth and the facts of the sacrificial death of Jesus. And whoever you are this morning, whether you're a believer, uh, whether you're not yet a believer, uh, whatever your sins and your sorrows and your lonelinesses are, there is forgiveness of sin to be found in Jesus. Don't you hear the echo of the cross this morning? The crucifixion of Jesus was not only the forsaking of the Son of God, but it was the completion of the plan and purpose of God in order to rescue sinners like you and like me and to be saved by his sacrificial death. So in a moment of forsakenness, a moment of forsakenness became the means of God's eternal purposes for the salvation of people like you and like me. There's pain involved, yes. There's grief. But there's hope that can coexist with a broken world. And if you ever doubt that, then look at the cross. We owed a debt we could not pay. But Jesus paid it all. My friends, if you're listening in this morning and you still don't know this, you might know about it. But you need to know there is forgiveness of sin for you. Do you know why you must be saved by God's gospel? You know, we hear a lot even in church circles. Well, you know, you, should, you need to be saved and, and uh, you need to know Jesus and you need to come to Jesus but nobody ever asks the question, why? I'm a pretty good person. I 
going to do anybody any harm. Why? What do we need to tell people? What do we need to tell them what Jesus has done? At the end of verse 31. He has done it. You need to know why he has done it for you. But you must be saved by God's gospel. It's not enough for me or any preacher to tell you you must be saved. You must trust Jesus. No, you must first be convinced of why do I so desperately need to trust Jesus? And why God the Father allowed his suffering? If you don't know why, then you don't really know the gospel. You need to understand how you can be saved and rescued from eternal hell and condemnation. So Christian, we are to know how we can speak to others about Christ. These are not human suggestions. These are not techniques. There is nothing more powerful than the word of God itself to impact sinful minds and hearts. God works through his word. And we need to know it and explain it. He calls us to speak out the gospel. We are forgiven because he was forsaken. And my responsibility to God is to speak the truth of God. It is to answer the question, why do I need to be saved? Because God is your creator. He's made all things, including you. He's perfectly holy and he cannot look on sin and he must punish sin. And you see that in the first book of the Bible in Genesis 3. Well, what about man? Well, we need to be saved because... We're sinful by nature. We're born in sin. We're, we're alienated from God. Some of us have been hostile to God. And therefore we're subject to the wrath of God. That's why you need to be saved. Thirdly, Jesus Christ who is fully God and fully man lived a sinless life. <laughs> that you and I can never live. And yet he, he bore my sin and your sin and all of God's wrath on the cross. So that all who would believe in him might come to have eternal life. That is why you need to be saved. Fourthly, God calls everyone here and everywhere. And that includes you if you're not yet a Christian. To repent of your sins. To trust in Christ. In order to be saved. That is what the world needs to know. None of this fluffy stuff about, you know, you know, just, just ask Jesus into your heart. And, and, and oh, yes, do that. But understand why you need to do it. And understand what has been done for you. Rather than what you think you must do for yourself. Speak the truth of God. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe. And are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Friends, there is nothing more powerful than God's word to impact minds and hearts. Harden minds and hearts. So when you feel forsaken, take heart in the message of this psalm. And take heart in the cross of Christ. And take heart that even through his forsakenness, it ultimately ends in triumph. So let us think seriously 
Let us think seriously of why you need to become a Christian. There is a day of judgment coming. But the good news is that God has provided a way of escape. And that everyone and anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith will find a welcome from him. May God continue to apply this word to your mind and to your heart. To, to give you a fresh insight of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ultimate victory and return. And may it be a comfort to our hearts and a joy to our souls. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, we praise you that Jesus lives. In the same body into which the nails were pounded, he sits even now on heaven's throne. And because he lives, death is no barrier to us. Sin is washed away and his promises have been fulfilled. And the ends of the earth will come and worship him. Lord, stir our hearts. For some of us, these are familiar truths. For others, they might be new. But stir the hearts afresh in all of us. And cause us to know what it is to live for you and to honour you. And this we ask in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.